Do this to make him commit to you. Hi, I'm Antje Boyd, founder and creator of the Magnetize Your Man Method. And ladies, of course, welcome back to the Track Your Right Guy online retreat today with my very dear friend and expert, Chris Sider. Hey, Chris. Hi, I'm so glad to be back. This is like the third one we've done, and it's always a blast every time. It's, it's so great. I'm always like, that was so good. I got to write that <laughs> down, you know? So ladies, for those of you who don't know who Chris is, he's the founder of the Ex-Boyfriend Recovery and has been helping thousands of brokenhearted individuals win their access back for over a decade. Chris, along with his handpicked coaches, help guide their clients using proven concepts and creative psychological methods to reattract their access and win them back for good. Currently, Chris offers his weekly advice through his podcast, together which generate over 100,000 downloads. And by the way, also his YouTube page currently has over 50,000 subscribers. All right. Well, awesome. What well, Chris, like, I'm really excited about the topic we're talking about today because I get this from women all the time, right? Like they're meeting a great man and, you know, and they're having a lot of fun and there's a lot of variety, but then they, there's no commitment, right? They feel like, Auntie, it's like, it doesn't seem to move forward. It's kind of either stalling or it's, it just kind of stays on the surface. So let's talk about what are some of the main tips that you have or secrets for the women to make him finally commit to you to stop like treading his feet in the water, one foot in, one foot out and have the exit door open for any time to leave. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always a difficult situation where you're in like, I don't know, pseudo relationships or like in an actual relationship or going through a breakup where someone you, you really want them and they don't really want you. And you're trying to figure out what can I, or there's maybe that like push and pull behind, you know, you're kind of like on again, off again, or you're kind of maybe like very close to being romantically involved, but not quite there and trying to get them to push them over the edge. And, you know, it's, it's funny, a, a few years ago, we started noticing a lot of our clients exhibiting this type of, you know, situation where they're like, okay, well, what can I do to get them to commit? And we kind of tried to come up with a framework for what revolves around commitment. Like how, what is universal signs or, or things that you can do to make someone want to commit to you. And over the years, we've actually expanded on a little bit because we've learned a little bit more, but the basic tenets are essentially um, something we like to call the interdependence theory. So essentially what this is, is it's basically describing all human relationships from a cost and benefit scenario. So theoretically, most humans are trying to get commitments where they're maximizing the benefits and minimizing the costs. And there's three specific criteria they tend to look at, right? So satisfaction, how satisfied they are in the relationship, alternatives, is there someone out there that can meet their needs better? And then investment. So this can be, you know, investment from a time, emotional energy perspective, but also investment from monetary perspectives, right? Now, what was interesting is when they actually studied, when scientists or psychotherapists studied uh, this concept, they found that even if you were in an incredibly unsatisfied relationship, and even if you sat there and felt while you were in this in incredibly unsatisfied relationship, there was someone else out there that was better for you, they still wouldn't leave their partners if they had invested a lot of time and energy. So if you're ever kind of looking or trying to understand, okay, well, which of the three tenets matters more, it would seem to us that it's investment. But when we actually started talking about our to our clients, like, hey, if you want to get, because we mostly deal with breakups. And while most of the people probably listening to this aren't dealing with going through a breakup, they're just trying to probably get, uh, you know, the love of their life and, you know, married and things like that. This can still apply because when we were dealing with people who were going through breakups, who were trying to win their exes back and trying to get their ex to commit to them, we found that when we explained this concept, it was like the light bulb went off. Like, oh, I, he mentioned how unsatisfied he was in our relationship or how, you know, I was too focused on my career and neglected that and didn't invest enough time. But what's interesting about it to, to us, at least, was 
even if you did everything perfectly, it still was not necessarily enough to make someone want to commit to you. So ultimately, it's kind of like, this is the how. This is the reasons for why people commit. But it's not necessarily how you get people to commit. There's a different set of tenets that we found that works from, from that angle. And usually, that's, that's the Black Friday method, right? So it's literally scarcity, urgency, fear of loss, those type of things seem to work the best to get commitments, but how you implement them is sort of important. So, you know, I mean, I think the the obvious one people like think of when they think of fear of loss is, oh, well, I just need to make my person jealous. That's not what it is. What it is, is making them realize that you will not wait around for them forever, that you are a hot commodity and there's only one of you. And there needs to be sometimes an urgent reason to make them want to commit. So theoretically, if you combine these you know, all these concepts together, you have maybe the cocktail of what it takes to get someone to commit to you. And there's probably more. That's the beautiful part about this. It, it is a science, but there's also an art aspect where we're learning more as we go. So those are the basic core fundamentals. Wow. This is <clears throat> so interesting. I love that you make distinctions that I never thought of that that the reason why someone is doing something is not like how you can actually then use it, right? Because that's what a lot of women do. They may read something in Cosmopolitan and they're like, oh, then that's, I'm just going to apply this and then it should work, yeah. right? Mm -mm. And and I think yeah. also what you were talking about, um, about the Black Friday method also speaks to the evolutionary standpoint as well, right? It really speaks to that like competitive scarcity yeah. part of the male brain. Yeah, that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, um, we, we really found that even if, because at first when we learned about the interdependence theory, the you know, satisfaction alternatives investment, the basic tenets there, we just would peddle that to all of our customers and clients. And like, this is what you need to do. This is why they're not committing. But after getting the data back, we were like, oh, there's something else involved here. We, And the beauty of it is a lot of, a lot of the big, huge, amazing things that we learn, we actually learn by mistake. Uh, what I mean by that is when interviewing success stories, people who are succeeding through our program, we actually learn, hey, this person's doing this. And then we are able to notice if you have a lot of success stories, what are the patterns? And we noticed the patterns was sort of that Black Friday concept. Because if you really think about it, Black Friday it's just a normal Friday. It's after Thanksgiving, right? But what makes it special is all the deals, right? And what really makes it special is, okay, you get this 50% off thing, but there's a limited amount of, you know, product and you know, it's going to be competitive, which obviously gets you into like this competitive mode to your point. Um, and I guess the beauty of it is, is most women, I don't think realize they almost need to look at themselves from a commitment standpoint where they have to kind of be willing to lose the guy. And I think that's the challenge. You know, I often say to my clients, you got to be willing to lose the guy to get the guy. And if you're not there emotionally, that's where you need to start. I think not with the satisfaction alternatives investment. I think it's really getting to that mentality where you're like, okay, I, I'll be okay. If I don't get this one person back, you're not going to put them on a pedestal, so to speak, bring them back down to your level. And that, of course, begs the question, right? How do you stabilize, especially most women that come to me are like more on the anxious scale. Yep. So the thought of losing someone that they actually have right now, so they would almost like create it, right, is unbearable. So where do you even start with that, Chris? Yeah, so, you know, it's really funny. When we, when we did our first interview, um, I think it was, it might've just been for the YouTube channel. I don't think it was yeah. like in a, in a retreat like this. Mm -hmm. Um, I was literally blown away on Tia by how, how like well-versed you were with the attachment style concepts, you know, mm -hmm. all the, the four basic core attached, you know, fearful, avoidant, anxious, secure. And so it was literally that interview inspired me to just like dig into the research and try to understand more about attachment styles. Cause I was thinking, wow, this is, this seems like a huge thing. And it's really amazing because I got curious and I started surveying my audience. How many of you guys are 
anxious attachment styles. And we found like 90% of our audience has anxious attachment styles. So when you say you're very familiar with the anxious attachment styles, so are we. Um, <laughs> so the, the challenge of course is like, well, how, you know, like the anxious attachment style is going to be the type of person that literally will not be able to take someone off a pedestal and the world is not right until they can fix this, you know, and they get that relationship aspect of their life fixed. The key is you have to really sit there and I'm, I'm, I know for a fact you, you tell this to your audience. So this is just probably going to be me reiterating all the things you already say. You need to start mimicking and become more secure in your attachment behavior because a secure person is not going to necessarily look at it like the end of the world if they don't get this one person back. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive making this mindset, sh mindset shift to where you're sitting there and thinking, okay, it's not the end of the world if I get this one person back. But if you do get to that space, weirdly enough, that's usually what attracts the guys. But we also do know that anxious attachment styles and avoidant attachment styles are often drawn together, right? And this is usually the, this is like the, the prototypical relationship that we see in our breakup business, right? Because most of our clients have anxious attachment styles. And then when we quiz them, we ask them, well, okay, well, what, what do you think your ex's attachment style is? Avoidant, almost a, like fearful avoidant or avoidant, but avoidant is always there, right? So then I started diving deep into avoidance and trying to understand what makes them tick. And the, probably the, the most insightful piece of advice I can give to anyone trying to understand an avoidant, if they have anxious attachment style tendencies, it would be this. An avoidant does not necessarily go through a breakup or they don't go through their avoidant stage the way you would necessarily expect. So what we found in our business was avoidance tend to be in love with nostalgia. So they actually, a lot of people think, well, someone who's, a, when they're in their avoidant stage, they're not going to miss me. That's not necessarily true. We found literature that actually backed this up. But basically, avoidance don't feel comfortable missing you until they feel like there's no chance they can get you. And then they give themselves permission to miss you. And so oftentimes we found by literally consulting like, hey, this is why it actually takes a little bit longer than you would expect if you have an avoidant ex because they don't begin to have that nostalgia until you've exhibited more secure behaviors and a secure type of thing to do after a breakup or when you realize a guy is maybe not into you is to actually pull back and start looking at other options. And then all of a sudden you may get a text from the avoidant. Like, hey, how are you? And that's that usually that's during their nostalgia stage. So there's all these other elements. It's the, the best analogy I could probably give you when you're looking at making a man commit is it's kind of like a spider web, right? So if you if you tag on this one aspect of the spider web, all these other things get impacted. So you have to try to find this delicate balance behind all the levers you're pulling behind making a man commit to you. Um, so I just basically went around in the circle and I forgot what we were talking about, but hopefully you got something out of that stream of consciousness. <laughs> I love it. No, because we were talking about how does the anxious woman actually go about like right. that concept of I'm okay to lose the guy. Right. That's right. the most so, devastating experience that they could ever have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think probably the only thing uh, actionable that I could give you to do is this concept we tell our clients called the Holy Trinity. It's not biblical or religious or anything like that. But basically, we find that people with anxious attachment behaviors focus way too much on the relationships portion of their life, right? So what we try to do is we try to tell people, try to divide your life up into three main portions, health, wealth, um, and relationships. And this, this is very basic. I mean, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. But if you're able to just do these basic things, what you're ultimately always trying to do is balancing each element, right? So you have an equal amount of time you're spending worrying about your health, your wealth, and your relationships. Now, what we tend to find with people who are anxious is all of their focus goes into the relationships portion of their life. And when it's not going well, what it does is it negatively impacts the other portions of their life. And then they just begin to get more anxious or more depressed or whatever have you. So as odd as it sounds, maybe one of the smartest things that you can do if you're finding that you're kind of like this, you're focusing so much of your elements or your time 
onto the elements of relationships, like focusing on the relationship with the guy that doesn't like you or your ex or whatever the situation is for you, trying to work backwards can actually be helpful for you to create momentum. So instead, what you might notice is maybe you've neglected your health a little bit. Maybe you've always wanted to be like um, trained for a marathon or something, right? So maybe start very slowly training for a marathon, put some more investment of your time into um, the health aspects of your relationship. Maybe you've started neglecting business type stuff, or maybe you've always wanted to quit your job and get a new job. I'm not saying quit your job. I'm just saying like, you, you get what I'm saying. I'm, this is an analogy, folks. Um, focus your energy on on that. What you tend to find happens is the relationships aspect kind of just takes care of itself. So you can kind of like, by healing the other elements, you can kind of begin to uh, create this positive momentum and create this positive routine with your life. And it breeds confidence and the confidence plays over into whenever you're talking to the guy. And also sometimes what it does is it's helpful to notice if you focus all your time on the health aspect and on the, on the wealth aspect, you don't necessarily care as much about the relationships aspect as you once did, because now you're a little bit more balanced. So I think that's probably the best actionable advice I would have for someone who's really struggling to exhibit secure behaviors. Um, but I'm actually curious what you have to say uh, about this, uh, you know, the exhibiting secure behaviors. I'm going to, I'm going to put my uh, college hat on here. And, and you take, take, some, take notes. It some notes. Yeah. You, know, you teach me. <laughs> the, the Holy Trinity concept you just described is actually exactly how a secure attachment style literally approaches their lives. Right. So they will never say that, you know, Susie came into my life and she's the center of my world, right? The reason why they're like so balanced. So that, for example, Brody told me the first night that I'm the girl of his story, because for him, it's not a big deal. Like I'm a quarter, let's say a, a quarter of the cake, right? So th there's three quarters of the cake that are different areas, right? So he has enough room to retreat back to, right? Like an yeah. anxious doesn't have that. The anxious yeah. the other way around. Like they maybe leave a square for, you know, I don't know their life, but three quarters or maybe even seven eighths, you know, <laughs> like. No, I, I love this uh, because it's basically, we're talking about the same idea here. We're just having different terminology to describe it. And I guess to go further into the deep, into the rabbit hole, I've been recently playing around with having a, an extra element to divide your life up into. Uh, and that's something I've been calling the magnum opus concept, because I notice a lot of times if you just divide your life, because I literally try to do this, right? I try to practice what I preach. So I sit there and I notice like, okay, health, wealth, relationships, but I notice that my, I'm not necessarily fulfilled. Um, I need something else that I'm super passionate about, like a, like a passion project, like a magnum yeah. opus, something that you want to be remembered for to spend your time on. So I've been like, like, that's another element that you can kind of spend your time on. So I guess what auntie and I are just saying is like, Hey, stop focusing so much on, on the guy and start focusing on all the other stuff of your life that you're neglecting. And, and I think the other piece also is, and this is going to be interesting for your research, Chris, it's also finding a way to not judge that anxious part because so the more you judge it, the more it strengthens, right? So it's like if you are you have a little girl, right? So yeah. like if you would be like, like, don't do this and don't do it, right? Like she would like scream louder if she thinks you don't really understand what she's saying, right? She's like, yeah, no, you don't yeah, get I, it, daddy. I had that conversation yesterday with her. Yeah. Okay, like, okay. Don't right, throw so that on the ground. And then, right. you know, the tantrum happens. It's you know, exactly but, right. But the tantrum happens because they're like, you don't get what I was saying. Like, you don't get what I was like trying to convey, right? So when we do that with our anxious part, because it's really like a little child, it's really like two years old, one year old, whenever it developed, right? Then it becomes stronger and louder and it sabotages too. So we need to find a way to say yes to that part without acting on it, right? But then ironically, when you give, a voice to the part, it actually gives more space for what you were saying, right? Like actually saying, hey, let's focus on a new hobby or let's like, yes, we can still get the candy, but why don't we just go on a walk around the block? Meaning, right, we still can get the guy, but why don't we just before we do that, whatever, you know what I mean? Learn to fly or something. I don't know. I have a lot of friends right now who take flying lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's, that's pretty cool though. Yeah. So the closest thing that I like w w when you were talking, I was just thinking like, it sounds a lot 
like uh, Carl Jung's integration of the shadow concept, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily like an apples to apples comparison, but his whole thing was like, each of us has like this dark side that we're afraid and suppress. And his whole theory was if you suppress it long enough, eventually it just overtakes you and you become consumed by it. So the way of, uh, of sort of transcending and, and having a transcendence type of uh, existence is to acknowledge you do have these dark impulses and to integrate and, and like master them, so to speak, like control them, I guess. Um, and I guess that's, that's sort of the way I would view the anxious side. Cause I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's easy to be hard on yourself and like, it, it kind of creates this self fulfilling negative talk in your head. If you're always sitting there and saying, why am I always like this? And I actually think avoidant people have this as well because, you know, avoidant people go through this cycle where they want a relationship. Then they get the relationship with the anxious person. The anxious person kind of freaks them out. They avoid, they leave, they do whatever. And then they're back at the beginning where they want a relationship again. And, but they're saying, why is this always happening to me? You know, and it just continues to repeat and repeat. And the more it repeats, the more it becomes like this real thing in their head. So, um, I think if you're anxious, just also understand avoidance also have kind of a similar thing. It's different. It's different for sure. But um, there's there's like these interesting commonalities when you're looking at attachment theories. But you, what I'm you, talking what, to the expert here. So Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I think we're both jamming off each other here. But I think what you just brought out that I never thought of was that actually, you know, what the avoidant does right? They're essentially, because what they're doing is like, they're judging that part that's like, so the avoidant goes within, right? Like I'm safe right. with myself yep. and the deep, deep, deep inside, right? So then what they're attracting is like a partner who judges that, right? Because like the anxious, would you agree that the anxious yeah. judges? Well, they want to be the fixers, right? So they want to be like, they want someone, they, they, in my, I've always, in you might have a different take on it but i've always viewed people who have anxious attachment styles as their entire lives need to be about relationships and like like making sure everything's right mm -hmm. you know like like that the cake is perfect but if 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 there's a bite out of the cake they freak out and it just goes crazy right so someone who's an avoidant you know i i think like the anxious person also kind of likes fixing the avoidant at first and maybe it works a little at first but the avoidant tendencies always end up kind of playing out a little bit but what I was saying was like, I actually want what would happen if, and I mean, I haven't done that work. You let me know how it goes. But um, <laughs> if you would actually take an avoidant and be like, oh, hey, so what are you judging yourself for? Right? Like, so my husband has like some avoidant tendencies. And so one judgment is like, oh, I should be more social. or I should have said more of this. Right. So I wonder if like, if the avoidant would not judge themselves for it, that then they would actually make more space to bring in a secure right? Because a secure is non-judgmental for the most part, right? A secure is like, you do you, I don't mean, you know, I'm cool either way, right? Like there's naturally more unconditionally loving versus the anxious is like taking everything personal, right? And it's like judging even more, you withdrew, or you're not social, or you're not an extrovert, or you're not like all those things, right? So I, I wonder, you know, I don't know. I can look at the research there. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's something I've only tried to consider it because so many of my clients' exes are avoidance. And so oftentimes when I'm interviewing them off camera, I'll say like, hey, did you ever have, a, like when they get them back, did you ever ever have a chance to like sit down and like literally dive deep into what was going on in their head? And oftentimes some of the most amazing things you'll hear that you're not expecting, like you know, that self-fulfilling thing that you really you're talking about, like the judging of the avoidant tendencies. Why am I always doing this? Why is this always happening? Um, it's pretty, it's pretty common. So while I don't necessarily think either of us have the research to back it up, I think our hypothesis has been proven true, at least in the small sample size that I've interviewed, which is really interesting to, to consider. So yeah, Another sorry, point. we're just jamming off, kind I of know. got away from the commitment thing. Yeah, lady. So this is how Chris and I hang out, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, you know, like, but you know, I mean, if you think about it, right, like then what would happen if, and this is, I think what actually practically happens, right? This idea of like, okay, so if the anxious starts to heal herself, right? So she's no longer judging the avoidant, which that was in my case, for example. So I was healing that more, moving more towards secure and then actually holding space for my husband, who's like, when he goes into within, right? Like how can I actually support that? So for example, we call it, he's sitting in the tree. 
So that's like when he's filling up his avoidant part, it's all by himself. He locks the door. I need to ring the bell. Okay. Yes. He has a bell on his office door. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like this idea, right? Like how can I, how can we actually support each other? And then in turn, he knows like when he leaves, he's going to tell me, I love you. He's going to be like, you know, is everything okay? Right. Like he knows just little check in that this anxious part inside of me appreciates, right? Like, but both moving more towards secure. So that would be, that would be how this would practically actually look like. What do you think about that, Chris? I think a lot of what you're talking about is really having deeper conversations involving trust. Because if you think about it, like the story you just told where like, okay, he's got some avoidant, he's mostly secure, but he's got some avoidant tendencies. You're mostly secure, but you have some anxious tendencies. And those parts of you don't necessarily always go away. So you've learned to communicate and it takes an incredible amount of trust to be that vulnerable, especially for someone who's an avoidant, you know, to, to basically explain like, Hey, this is something that I do. And also for you to explain like, well, you know, when you do that, I'm happy to give you space, but if you can give me like a little something that will hold me over and like, you know, and, and that delicate type of trust, um, I think it really has more to like what you're talking about has more to do with, with how you're having conversations and, and building that level of, of emotional intimacy, you know, at least that, that would be my take on it. Um, because I'm dealing with people who are not very trusting, mm-hmm. right? So the, the big thing is like rebuilding trust and, and things like that. Um, and it's incredible how something that seems so simple, like anyone listening to this is probably seeing, like listening to us and being like, oh, this seems so simple. Yet when it comes time to implement, it is not simple. And it is really scary to be vulnerable, even though it sounds ridiculous when we kind of like, okay, like all you're really saying is like, yeah, every once in a while, it's nice to know that you acknowledge that anxious side of me. That is so simple to say, but when it's, when it's you and it's your personal, I mean, it's so hard to be that vulnerable. And I think it really takes a lot of uh, confidence to, to be okay with being that vulnerable. So I guess uh, my take on it was that's, that's the place you should start. You should be like that confident to get that vulnerable because it, it, you know, once, once you're that vulnerable with Brody, it makes him want to be more vulnerable too. Cause it, it's just kind of like this beautiful give and take. Um, so again, we're off the beaten path here, but, but yeah. What you're really saying is like really the anxious as well as the avoidant, right. Want to break out of their cycle. They do. Right. Yes. And, they and, are, if, if they're, if I, so this is an interesting question. Sorry. I, I, do you think, <laughs> yeah, who end up you soon? Right, yeah, yeah. So, so here's my here's my question for you, Antia. Do you literally think I'm just brainstorming? They want to break out of the cycle, right? But do they have to acknowledge that they are in the cycle? Because I noticed like there's two types of people. There's people who don't realize they're in the cycle. They don't really give it enough philosophical thought to realize it. And then there's the people who do realize it but can't stop it. Do you think it? I mean, I would say definitely for the anxious, I had to be aware of it because I had to see how, what my payoffs were. Right. So like running my anxious part gave me, uh, you know, oh, this feels familiar. Oh, I get to connect with myself. Oh, I get to call my girlfriend and be like, you know, right. Which, which builds up my oxytocin inside of myself talking to my, now it's going to be interesting to actually see from the avoidant. What I can say is um, I have a client who just got into a very successful relationship with an avoidant. And he actually said that him becoming aware of that he is avoidant, right. Made all the difference, right. Because now he can see himself be like, you know what, in the past, I would have just walked out on this conversation right now, but I see what this part wants to do. And I don't want to do that anymore. I mean, he literally told her that, right. So that makes yeah. me believe, like, I think they do need to be aware of. Oh, I remember when Brody had some avoidant men come to him when he was working with men. He's not doing it anymore. Um, they were really like, you know, I've been avoidant. Now I'm 40 and I'm single and I'm not married and I'm successful, but I have nothing. So there's usually some sort of acknowledgement. It may not be like massive. It may not be the awareness. May not may not even know where to start. But just be like, I'm, I'm running on something, right? Because the pattern repeats itself. So I think that needs to be there. 
but again, I can just speak mostly. No, I think you're right. I mean, that would be my hypothesis as well. And the only reason I think, I think is I've had a similar experience because we mostly talk with women, right? Ex-boyfriend recovery is mostly what I'm known for, but we also have this little tiny site called ex-girlfriend recovery, which is the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll get men coming to the program. It was interesting. I was doing a Facebook live and I was talking about attachment styles, right? And like really recognizing your own attachment style and the concept of becoming more secure. And this is the kind of work you need to be doing before you even try to attempt to get an ex back and things like that. And the, there was a guy, he was watching, he commented, he was like, I've never heard of attachment styles before, but this just blew my mind. I'm an avoidant, you know? So I think, and, and that's not the first time that's happened. It kept happening with different men. Once you like almost teach them because it, it even I, I, I had heard of attachment styles before I came on to your podcast or your YouTube channel, but it was really after talking to you that I was like, oh, wait, there's a lot of connections here to, to the work I'm doing. I really need to like become an expert on this. So I started just reading everything to try to understand the nuances. And I'm not perfect yet. I don't know everything yet. I don't think anyone can claim they'd know everything perfectly, but it's, it's amazing to me how many people, like once you know it and it realize it, you realize you can like point out, like, this is an avoidant behavior. Mm -hmm. This is how to handle this. Um, this is how a secure people, a secure person handles this. It's, a, it's amazing. Just the education aspect. Um, and while I didn't, I did know of it. It's, it's just amazing how many people to me don't even know of it. Like mm -hmm. so many people go into relationships without even understanding the concept of attachment styles. And to me, I think it, I think in, while we have gotten a little off of the commitment aspect, I think it is really important to figure out your attachment style, your, your partner's attachment style for a commitment, because Absolutely. if you're, if you're anxious and your partner's avoidant, you need to recognize their avoidant tendencies, but where it gets challenging is how to have a conversation with them to educate them. Because I noticed it's kind of a shoot the messenger type situation. Like they're not going to take you seriously. If you're like, well, you're just being avoidant. I'm going to give you some literature here to check out like your avoidant tendencies. So you can work on that. It's almost like they need someone else to tell them, or they need to come up with the, like the, the need or the want to learn about the attachment styles. So I think that that would be actually an interesting thing to, to breach, you know, Well, think about it. So just by definition, right? Like the, the avoidant will not go first because the avoidant needs an emotional roadmap. Okay. Right. There's a high level of disassociation going on. So what worked for me is actually leading by example, like calling myself out by telling my husband, by the way, I have something called, you know, cause you may not know about it. And I mean, I was a little lucky cause he trained men and all the things. So I knew he had some psychology background and you know, but I'm like, I still didn't assume that he knows it, but you know, just like, just, you know, I have this anxious attachment style. This is how it shows up, right. To also be like, okay, you have this attachment style, right. But what does that mean to me? Right. So what that could mean to you is like, I start acting weird or I just withdraw or I just start to <laughs> become insecure, or whatever it is. Right. So like always calling myself out or being like, Hey, I wanted to sabotage you or, you know, or say with this ring, I set you free. Because that gives the, so that's a little bit the beauty of the anxious, right? They're so in tune with the nuances that that's actually a gift to the avoidant because they're not like that at all, right? They're yeah. like, everything is completely hidden. They have no map inside of themselves emotionally. I, I literally could talk for hours. I know, I know. We're like, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, and this had everything to do with commitment. You know why? Because Nobody can commit to you if you don't acknowledge and accept your anxiety, anxious attachment style, right? So if I would right. be like, no, I'm secure. I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not anxious, right? Then there's no way that Brody would have committed to me. Like, there's no way that, would, that it would have worked out because the anxious part would have said, like, that's a bunch of baloney. I'll show well, yeah, you I otherwise. Mean, it, it, you know it really I mean? goes, no, it really goes into to s something that I find people have the hardest thing time doing, which is extreme ownership Absolutely. and being completely honest with yourself and being like, yeah, I have some severe anxious tendencies and I need to work on those. Most people recognize it, but they don't take ownership of it. And there's, I think it's important to understand the distinction. So like auntie is just basically saying, you need to take ownership of it, own it. And then you'll be able to like see a more easy commitments potentially happening. So let me ask you this, Chris, like, you know, I always love great stories 
So do you have a story of a, a woman that you worked with where, you know, she was more on the anxious side of things and she was able to move more towards secure as a consequence of you actually starting you know to understand that and have even like the man commit to her who knows since we'll have that yeah part. so i've got a ton of stories of the other thing happening where they they don't fix themselves so uh, the, that yes. really goes into the the extreme ownership aspect but you know the beauty of this is ever since we talked i updated my program to include or acknowledge the attachment styles and the importance of this so like I said, most of our clients are trying to get their exes back. So there's this period of time after, after they go through the breakup where we implement something called a no contact rule. This is where you cut off all communication. There's some situations where that you can't do that, but let's just take a general situation. Cut off all communication. What we used to think was, oh, this is like a reverse psychology thing. It will make your ex miss you. You know, you you just, you know, like stop talking to me and it kind of creates this re reactant psychology. But what we really learned is what you do with that time is important. And we found that the people who are able to outgrow their exes get to this place emotionally where they acknowledge, hey, actually I've got the the thing so chris of course i always love good stories so do you have a story of an anxious woman who you were able to help to actually find more you know acknowledge more that she's anxious perhaps or starting to move more towards secure in her own resourcefulness and then you know have success in that journey yeah, we, we've got, so we've got plenty on both ends of the spectrum. So I want, I want to say that I, I'm not some sort of miracle worker because I think a lot of times people go into the program expecting me to have done all the work for them. And I have done all the work from a research perspective and like figured out like this is what's going to work the best, but you still have to do the work. And that's, that's the rub, you know? Um, so the beauty is one of the things that I am most proud of is the, the ability to basically sit down, have honest conversations with women who are able to be successful and try to figure out what they're doing. So oftentimes the big thing that we've learned through interviewing women, just hundreds of women is how they were able to outgrow their exes because we're dealing mostly with people who want to get their exes back. You know, we find we've actually got uh, closer to a 70% success rate now, which is really, really good. Um, and we find a lot of a lot of the people that quote unquote don't get their exes back after going through our program just kind of choose not to get their exes back, which we certainly consider a success, but we don't include it into that 70% metric, but I'm getting off, off the beaten path here. So what's interesting is um, the protocol typically when you're going through a breakup that we recommend is uh, you go through the breakup, you're usually really anxious. 90% of our clients have anxious, uh, anxious uh, personality types. Their, their exes tend to be avoidant personality types. Um, so we tell them to do the scariest thing in the world, and that's to cut off all communication via the no contact rule. Um, now, the no contact rule is usually like a 21 to 45 day period where you're cutting off all communication. You're supposed to spend it working on yourself. And when we say working on yourself, it's basically acknowledging your anxious tendencies, trying not necessarily to get rid of them, but doing some of the things that Auntie and I were talking about before, which is like realizing too much of the cake or too much of the pie is dedicated to your relationship. We need to kind of like make that a, you know, a normal 33% slice of the cake and, you know, ha balance everything else out. And we're noticing that the people who are able to do that end up really changing their lives because their outlook is completely different. They start re recognizing, wow, I was so anxious. I blew up their phone 50 times. I left 500 voicemails. Uh, that's not real. I'm just, you know, over exaggerating. But the point is they're realizing when they have these urges and stopping them and pulling them in. So it, it kind of goes, I would actually argue most of our success stories end up going through that process where they are not necessarily changing their entire attachment styles. Cause I think it's more of like a percentage, you know, like they're able to exhibit 80% secure behaviors with maybe 20% anxious behaviors. Cause as your point, I don't think it ever necessarily goes away. I think there's urges every once in a while. I mean, we can argue about that. We're, we're finding though, that a lot of our success stories are, but it does take time. And maybe the big challenge that we're having right now is actually 
the sustainability of it. Because I think a lot of times people forget to keep doing that type of internal work once they have their goal, once they, uh, I guess for your audience, like get married or find the guy of their dreams, the work doesn't stop. You still are supposed to keep consistent. And, and maybe the simplest analogy I can give is it's like literally working out right? Like you keep working out if you want to stay in good shape, but if you stop working out, well, you're not going to see a, like a, a loss immediately. It will take some time, but if you never work out again, guess what? You're not going to be as in, in great shape anymore. It just takes work. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> yes, totally, totally. And uh, Chris, for the women who are totally enticed, which I, I would be if I was single, um, what's the best way, way what's, what's like a free gift that you have for them to start to continue on this journey with you? Yeah, so our website has a number of like free articles and everything like that that you can read. Uh, but probably the, the place I would start for most people who are at least going through a breakup and just want help through that um, is to actually go to our website and take what we call the X recovery chances quiz. We put together this like two minute free quiz that's designed to basically tell you what kind of chance you have of getting your X back. And then after that, we send you like this free video course of like, Hey, these are the basics you need to keep in mind. And then we introduce you to a couple of our products to see which one's the right fit for you. No hard feelings. If you're like, I don't want to buy anything. We have plenty of free articles. So I think Antia might put a, we'll put a link that in the right description along. or, or right. something. Mm -hmm. You can just check that out. And um, it's a free quiz, takes two minutes to complete, and you'll at least get some information on your last relationship. Oh, awesome, Chris. Well, it's been such a pleasure to jam with you. It's like so fun. Ladies, you literally see like how Chris and I like always just hang out before the interview. So like you got yep. an inside <laughs> look that's really rare, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and thank you so much for being here, Chris. And for the ladies, I'll see you in the next interview. Take care. Bye.